in our longstanding work with nonprofit uh, leaders uh, through our MO and our social work programs, we've identified a, a kind of lingering gap in training related to fundraising, nonprofit fundraising. And so we're hoping that we can get underway with a new certificate program. So we want to provide you uh, context for that. Uh, and then really seek your advice on uh, kind of the next steps. And I'm really pleased that uh, Dan Mansour is, is here. He's been uh, really part of this, uh, the development of this from the very beginning. And his deep expertise in uh, nonprofit fundraising is a, is a huge asset for us at the school. So um, I thought I would uh, start us off with, with a little context. And then uh, Dan and I will uh, do this presentation um, and then really open it up for a dialogue with you, which is what we um, would really value as part of your of this short time that we have together. So uh, back in, in uh, really pre-pandemic, we began uh, examining more closely um, the, the landscape regarding nonprofit uh, fundraising and development in Northeast Ohio. And with uh, generous support from uh, the Kelvin and Eleanor Smith uh, Foundation, they funded a, a feasibility study, an assessment of the landscape, specifically on the education of uh, fundraising and development professionals in Northeast Ohio. And what we learned from that work, which uh, included about 30 uh, in-depth interviews and then a an online survey of over 200 uh, professionals working in the field, uh, we learned a variety of things. And Dan, Dan will share some of that as well. Um, but, you know, we, we all know that uh, these roles are really essential to the healthy functioning of our nonprofits um, in as much as, as they deliver the resources that make the mission real, um, they, are, they are foundational. And as much as um, students in our MO program may not really see themselves as fundraisers, we know that all nonprofit leaders have to have capacities in, in, in the fundraising space uh, to be successful uh, across the board. So what we learned from that examination is that there's, there's really a mixed bag of opportunities for continuing education for folks in, in fundraising and development. Uh, and this is coupled with the reality that there's often very limited resources at their organizations and personally, professionally, to invest in this kind of professional development. So, you know, we've got this kind of devilish combination of the, the need is there uh, and often the resources uh, are, are, don't allow folks to take advantage of, of those um, opportunities. Uh, and then something else that emerged very closely, uh, quickly in this examination was the reality that there's kind of a has and have nots uh, situation among nonprofits that also disadvantages grassroots and particularly organizations uh, serving uh, uh, underrepresented populations uh, to really access these kinds of learning opportunities. So as part of that examination, uh, you know, what became clear is as much as uh, nonprofit management education has now been accepted as a, as a discipline, really since the 1980s, fundraising as a distinct subfield um, has really grown and, and um, taken traction um, as part of that broader domain. But even still, there's relatively few kind of accepted credentials out there in the field, the CFRE um, being um, one that is well known, um, coupled with uh, you know, a continuing commitment to resource development and fundraising as really a core competency in nonprofit management education. Um, among those, uh, NAC, which uh, Mandel School is a founding member of, it has always had um, these kind of competencies as part of the core of what nonprofit managers need to know. So as, as I mentioned before, this study that we undertook over 
about a nine month period, um, tried to take stock of what we what we see as the landscape. We didn't want to just uh, venture forth and start creating new programming without kind of the market test. And you know the the high level findings is that and things that caused us concern is that we found among fundraisers, you know, concerns about their own job satisfaction, uh, which certainly relates to turnover in the field, uh, something that many organizations struggle with in these roles. Um, and this, uh, in some sense, a stigma around being a nonprofit fundraiser, both even within organizations that benefit from uh, the work of these fundraisers, feeling that like there's an otherness to being a fundraiser that's separate and apart from program delivery uh, and all the other uh, kind of core functions. So, you know, thinking about that stigma, thinking about um, turnover and job satisfaction concerns, and then generally a lack of diversity in these roles um, across the sector, lack of racial and gender uh, diversity in among fund and fundraising uh, professionals. So this you know, caused us to reflect on how are we making these opportunities available and how are they, um, how can we make them more equitably available, um, uh, kind of un, un disconnected from organization size and those capacity issues that I mentioned. So, you know, from the beginning, we, we, we believe that you know, the Mandel School, because of its long commitment to nonprofit management, could play a role here. Um, but we weren't, uh, you know, we weren't going into this thinking we need to be the provider because there are many partners in the space um, like BVU and um, Association for Fundraising Professionals. And there are other national players like uh, the Lilly School at Indiana University. So we wanted to make sure whatever we developed was um, augmenting opportunities. But we really do think that that we could be a strong uh, player in this space. And we, we heard that very clearly from the folks that we engaged in the study that while many of these sources are valued, they saw an academic affiliation to um, these kinds of programs as essential to getting kind of the best evidence in play and having um, theory inform the practice um, as two, um, two dimensions that universities are particularly well positioned uh, to bring. So I'm going to pass it over to Dan now. Thanks, Rob. I want to add that one of the things that came out of the study, which was um, fairly powerful, is we weren't just surveying um, practitioners in the field. We were also talking to funders and philanthropists, and they emphasized that they wanted the level of professionalism and competency, including emotional intelligence and many, the many other things that are involved in, in effective fundraising to be part of a more intensive curriculum um, to advance the profession. Um, yeah. As you all know, this is an incredibly generous community. Um, I haven't seen any specific study on the totals, but if one sort of extrapolates from the nationals and looks at the population, almost $3 billion is given in charitable contributions in Northeast Ohio, probably more since Cleveland has a reputation of being extremely generous, both in terms of individuals and foundations. Um, the high demand for skilled and passion fundraising professionals is there. And, and there has not been to this date, um, you know, uh, consistency in the quality of training and workshops um, that are available. And as you all know, there's incredibly high turnover rate uh, among quality fundraising professionals. Um, and, and that's a detriment to our jobs because, as you know, the best of fundraisers build relationships over a lifetime with their constituents, and uh, that has diminished greatly. So, you know, the goals are, are fairly, you know, obvious, improve long-term fundraising results um, and, and give the professionals the confidence that this is not just part of their job, but one that they can do very, very well. Um, retaining quality professionals, I think the reward comes from the success as well as respect that you have uh, in your organization as a successful fundraiser. 
And I don't want to go through all these uh, one by one, but um, I do want to mention that one of the goals of this program and this certificate is to create a, a community, a cohort of of like-minded and well-trained and like-trained uh, fundraising professionals. Um, we, whether we work in a small organization or a large one, we we need the confidence, uh, the confidence to talk to people and get support from others who are going through what we're going through. And we view this again, uh, not as a one-off certificate program, but maybe in the model of the Cleveland Leadership, um, or lead, uh, Cle Cleveland Leadership Program, uh, a group of alumni that will look to each other for ongoing support and development. And finally, you know, building professional fundraising skills and expertise will lead, I think, to a much truer partnership with our funders, less of a give and take and more of a cooperative effort to achieve the goals of, uh, of our organizations. So the, this is a structure that's currently contemplated for the certificate program. Um, it'll be a professional development certificate offered by the Mandel School. Um, the cost is reasonable for the quality that we're getting here. Um, for each of the courses, 1500 with a full amount of 6000 for the certificate. I'll point out right now that we're seeking scholarships, particularly for the smaller organizations that uh, are not able to fund that. And we're, of course, hopeful that this will be funded not by necessarily the individuals, but by the organizations that, um, uh, that the professionals are working for. Um, as of now, we've got two required courses and two electives. Um, the required are, are, are critical, I think, to really understanding the nature of fundraising and philanthropy today. Um, one we call the landscapes and trends, and it's a deep down, uh, in-depth look at the trends and technologies and activities and, and really the statistics that shape fundraising and philanthropy today. And we hope that that will be not only on a, a national level, but also on a regional and very specific level to the greater Cleveland area. And the second course uh, we call Science, Technology, and Design. And that's an unusual title for, uh, for fundraising, but um, it's based on our understanding that behavioral sciences, both economics and psychology, play a critical role in our effectiveness as fundraisers. Technology is still not fully embraced in our field um, in the same way that it is in the, in the for-profit sector. And, and that is gonna be critical, I think, to uh, improving how fundraising is, is, um, is executed. And finally, design. And the concept of design is really creativity. Um, it is how do we bring new ideas to the work um, that uh, is so critical to, um, to our organizations. And then a whole set of potential electives. I'd like to think that the, the emphasis, and I would encourage everyone to focus on the solicitation training because ultimately it comes down to the interaction that we have on a one-on-one -on -one basis that leads to the kinds of gifts that transform our organizations. And uh, we love your response and, and feedback when we get to the end of the presentation. So finally, uh, the, the benefits of this is obviously creating a cohort of highly, and I emphasize highly competent senior level professionals. And I'll say that the target audience for this certificate may be uh, senior development officers, vice presidents, chief development officers, but it also can be um, executive directors and CEOs, especially for smaller organizations where that is a natural and a critical part of their job function. Um, it may also be uh, high quality and um, experienced fundraisers who are doing major gift work and one-on-one -on -one solicitations uh, among major donors. Uh, the benefit will undoubtedly be increased philanthropic results and a higher level of donor and funder satisfaction. And, and I, 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 it's, it's hard to underestimate and uh, the importance of making sure donors are not only doing their, their part in supporting our, our nonprofit community, but are also feeling really good about that process, which uh, has always been a challenge in this field. Assembling a group of potential leadership mentors. And then the training is not only for the benefit of the individuals who participate, but the role they will play in sharing their ex new expertise and their experience um, with their own staffs, with their board members and, uh, and with their volunteers. And finally, uh, engagement and partnership among the professional staff, funders and philanthropists. You know, 
we really want to move away from sort of the give and take mentality that often uh, describes our field to really a, a truer partnership. And that comes from a greater understanding of um, how we can be effective fundraisers and fund and effective partners with those who have the resources to support our work. Rob, back to you, I believe. Yes, so many of you know that, you know, I make most of my uh, work life in studying the effectiveness of different interventions. So thinking about the outcomes of, you know, uh, investing in this kind of additional training for fundraisers leads us to think about what, what articulated outcomes would we suppose will be there. Um, I mean, certainly there's this idea that we're building a community of fundraising leaders. Um, and, and arguably, we already have many of those folks in the field. They're well known, but really broadening what that looks like and increasing the talent that's coming from underrepresented groups that have historically not um, been um, invited into fundraising as a prof profession. We'd also hope that, you know, as organizations are more advanced in their fundraising work and more successful, that that will improve uh, their relationships with their philanthropic partners. And some of the things we heard from philanthropic interviews early on was a dissatisfaction with some of the fundraising uh, folks that they were in contact from different organizations as not being really up to par and doing the work well. So that certainly doesn't reflect well on organizations nor the individual. Um, so those relationships could be enhanced. And then certainly, uh, hopefully leading to increased tenure, as you heard Dan say that, you know, that tenure of, of fundraising staff allows those relationships to flourish over time. So folks job hopping uh, isn't necessarily good for the organization they left nor the organization they went to. Uh, and then, if all of these practices are well implemented, um, then we'd actually see better fundraising results on the, the bottom line from fundraising work. Oh, just quickly. So on the, you know, what are we, where are we right now? So we have been working on, on this, you know, the pandemic certainly hasn't helped our cause um, in getting launched, but we're planning for a fall launch and we are uh, heavily into fundraising for the fundraising certificate. So we have to invest upfront to build this. And we're about halfway to our funding goal at the moment of about nearly $80,000 to get the program underway. And then our model is really that once we uh, secure sufficient scholarship support, which we've had a lot of interest in from organizations who uh, would like to fund a cohort or um, donors who would like to sponsor uh, scholarships for particular organizations um, or particular um, individuals that are fundraisers, um, that that can help uh, sustain this model over over time. So I think we're coming. I think we're coming to the end of the talk at you part, and now we're going to move to the hear from you um, piece. But we welcome your questions and your comments. Just come off, come off mute and jump in. I am that that person who um, came to fundraising um, to know that fundraising was an important skill to have as a nonprofit practitioner. Came out of the graduate program, learned to really focus on learning from watching, reading all the solicitation letters I would get uh, and things like that, but really had to learn um, by way of um, just going to work every day in a nonprofit where I was focused on programs. I had to learn really quickly that if I was gonna be at, good at programs and the deliverables, that I need to know, get to know the grant writer. I knew to build that relationship so that I could learn about um, grant writing and, and how to be stronger. I love how you um, phrased it, groups who have not been invited into the, the industry, into learning how to fundraise. So I'm excited. I said all that to say, I, I'm cycling through. I got to a place where I am in, the, in a leadership position, um, but still had to fight with um, supporting my board to understand that we needed people. We needed to invest in fundraising so that we could make the money that they wanted. And we need to invest in a way 
um, that we could be responsive to our donors in the way that they want it. You know, I'm coming from a, a small organization perspective and I'm thinking, one, how is this going to be equitable when this program is rolled, rolled out? And we know what we know about um, what it looks like um, in terms of the field, um, heavily women, I'm, I'm assuming heavily white women, um, you know, some men um, at in the top jobs, very few people of color. Um, and sometimes we even forget that black, black and brown people, you know, are philanthropists. You know, our names might not be on buildings, but pro I promise you there is money, you know, like, so I'm thinking about equity when I see this. I'm, I'm thinking about in the way of, you know, people of color, um, maybe some other marginalized groups. I liked hearing about the scholarships because who gets invited to participate? Um, small nonprofits, you know, six, they might have, you know, a couple hundred dollars in budget lines for professional development, but not always 6,000, you know, um, in one year. I'm saying all that to say, those are my guttural um, reactions to seeing it. Um, there's excitement, there's skepticism about it not being so elitist and, uh, you know, and, and how do we create access? Thank you, Seven. And I, I just wanted to pick up on one thing you said. And you know, obviously, as a degree granting institution with our longstanding social work and MO degree, um, you might say, well, could we could we build more into that? And it because we're because we are very expensive, that's that that that's always going to be a barrier for us. And within mm -hmm. our MO degree, we have two courses that really are about fundraising and revenue development. And there's just not space in there for somebody to do a focus on um, fundraising as a specialty. But mm -hmm. one of my hopes is that this work will lead to more course development, uh, credit bearing course development within the MO related to fundraising. But in the short term, the idea of doing something that's more accessible, highly scholarship um, targeted to organizations that really stand to benefit. Uh, that have been blocked and walled off from these kinds of opportunities is something that we think is is really where we need to be as, as a school of social work and nonprofit management. Other reactions? Yeah, yeah thank here. you, Rob. Hi. Thank you, Rob and, and Dan. And Rob, thanks for all the help you've given our music therapy department at the Music Settlement over the years. A lot of thoughts have gone through my mind. So I'm a I'm SAS graduate, and I think I, I graduated before there was the certificate in nonprofit. I think there's a real need for this here. I think it's a really well thought out program. It's very focused. It's pragmatic, and but it's um it's been hit or miss, and it's been here and there. And I've learned from books. I've learned from the nonprofit leadership lab I belong to, and all BVU was on their board for 15 years. But this is really um I, I think it's great, and I think it's great if it's housed at MSAS. Um, I think that your premises and your approaches are absolutely spot on. One thing, again, that's really apparent to me is I go after general operating monies and uh, capital right now in the quiet phase of a large capital campaign is just that um, the, the competition also. I mean, something else that occurred in your list of premises is that there's a lot more competition for um, at foundations and maybe fewer funds. I mean, we're all going after the same dollars. And right now, I'm in university circle. I think there's about, out of the 42 institutions, I think of at least half of us are in capital campaigns. So again, knowing, you know, being guided as to how to do this well in all areas is really a real bonus. The burnout is real. Um, as I look for resumes, Phyllis, to hire people, you're right, I'm not finding BIPOC. Um, which my idea committees, you know, we're trying to get more people into senior management. And also um, people seem to leave the field after one or two years, high degree of burnout. So um, I think this would greatly help as well. And importantly, what I find really helpful, and I found this in my legal career in here, is establishing that cohort, that group of people that can collaborate, brainstorm, support each other, really, really critical. And I don't think that exists right now. You know, it's it's obvious that it's a need and you guys have through the pandemic been very dedicated to making this a reality. So I appreciate um, you and Rob and your attention to this because it's organizations that I fund at UBF that could stand to benefit the most. 
Um, we talked about our cohorts of people um, that we were working with and collaboratives that have memberships with AFP and we were kind of holding them in some sort of um, sessions pre and post the AFP events to say, hey, what as a collective, what did you think about that one? Hey, which one did you go to that somebody else didn't, you know? And so all of that created a sense of camaraderie um, and um, people are excited about these types of things. Uh, so I'll just say that. Um, so we definitely would like to still link to you all um, maybe being a pipeline. A couple things, you know, one, we have to make Cleveland fun too, right? Conferences have that draw because of an appeal and travel and community and seeing things new. And I think you all being the institution of higher learning that you are, um, won't necessarily pursue that um, as a motivation for people to come and go through the class, right? Whether they're in the community or external to the community. But I think it's something to consider um, how you can be slightly less academic and more, I think you referenced Leadership Cleveland-esque, where there are um, external opportunities for um, camaraderie and, you know, just taking it all in. At the end of the day, I just would encourage you all to, to, I know the natural tendency will be to be extremely class oriented, academically based and, you know, methodical, but also, uh, you know, there's a, an appeal, um, when there's a, a form of, uh, fellowship attached with this. I just wish you well, and uh, you got my vote and my money too. So we'll, we'll try to we'll try to commit to making sure that we create some form of scholarships with you all. So thanks, Lisa. Yeah, thank you all. The other thing about the uh, something we have struggled with is we the the valuing of a cohort of Northeast Ohio fundraisers is something we value, but there's always the temptation to make the certificate more broadly available, virtual, you know, bring in a national audience, which would in some ways jeopardize that. And it, it could be done in separate separate cohorts, but you know, we, we do we do want to start with um, a Cleveland-based learning uh, cohort as as our main focus. That's good to know. I, I, you know, I think the larger organizations, Harvard, the Kennedy School, they're poaching right into our areas um, virtually and, you know, potentially uh, inviting people to campus. It's a different price tag, a different target audience. Um, so I think, you know, keeping it local is smart. Yeah. So sorry, I'm trying to formulate still thoughts, but agree with Cecil, fun and cohort, you know, so I'm a Bridge Builder alum, loved the program, still talk to a lot of my cohort. And then I also went through UBF's cohort last year. And that, you know, was really powerful to be with the same group of people <clears throat> going through the process and just learning about being a leader in Cleveland, all the things that there are to learn about being a leader. And then also with, you know, and just trying to get scholarships. I think as a smaller organization, I know I wouldn't be able to to pay for someone to go through that certificate program unless it was funded. And I think a part of me would be a little fearful to put forth $6,000 because I feel like a bigger organization who then after that person gets that certificate can swoop in, pay more, give more benefits. And so, you know, I'm also thinking of that, like, oh, like how does that still impact smaller nonprofits that can't always compete in a pay um, or benefits area, but then we put through, you know, a lot of grassroots people, but then they're going to be swooped up. So, you know, is there, an, I don't know if there's a solution for that. I think that's always going to happen, but how do we make sure we're not being the ones that constantly get the turnover? That's just my, my thoughts right now. There are two thoughts that come to mind. One is there, there, you know, my daughter works for a company. She got a bonus when she signed coming out of college. She has to pay the bonus back if she lives within a certain period of time. So we, we may, as a condition, say, you know, if you're being sponsored by an organization, either by a donor in a scholarship or by the organization itself, you are committed to at least two years or whatever the case might be. 
and the growth is not just in the field, but it's as a per, personal and professional growth that are the, the kinds of experiences that we have to provide. And maybe our job in the certificate program is also to bring in at least for one session or have a session with that person's supervisor to introduce them to the kinds of things that will help them retain their staff. Maybe another natural uh, audience for you all to target are the recruiters. You know, they're internal candidates that still um, may be considered if they have this skill set added to um, their background, um, which sometimes is a more loyal, committed, long term person. Um, so I just would encourage you all to, you know, as as headhunters and recruiters are actively engaged these days, um, trying to find quality people uh, that may be a natural audience just to say, hey, uh, this is what we're providing for career paths that are transitioning into different spaces. On that point, too, and I, I don't think this is just limited to development professionals, um, also enticing audiences from executive directors and CEOs. There was an idea that was floated around a while ago, and I don't know where where it came from and under what context, but the idea was, and this addresses the idea of people leaving, um, is, is why don't we allow our employees to do a short sabbatic? You take one of your professionals who needs a certain set of skills that they're not getting or experiences that they're not getting, swap it with somebody from one of the partner nonprofits in the community and come back after three or six months um, to the organization, uh, richer, more uh, with more diverse experience with new ideas that they can apply. Yeah, I absolutely think that people are going to have to be forced to think outside of the status quo and the dominant culture way of thinking about, you know, uh, all of it. Um, so, you know, you know, when you first started talking about that idea, I was like, what? I would do what? And then I thought, why not? You know, what, what, are, what are we stuck on? What are we afraid of? The Smith Foundation, when they commissioned our study, actually included us exploring whether we should do education for program officers in foundations. And we quickly learned that plenty available, they got all the money in the world they need to buy whatever they want. And a lot of that was actually parochial and specific to learn the way we do foundation work. So it wasn't necessarily that we were going to be able to offer something that people could. So we we um, discontinued any further work on that and focused exclusively on the fundraising education. You interviewed foundations also to talk about what they don't right the behaviors or the the pitches that you know frustrate them or turn them off or whatever. Yes, right, because that's important. I did listen to a webinar recently. It was a a, ma a very major philanthropist, and she was talking about the way that sometimes she's approached by nonprofits and how, you know, just it really turned her off or angered her or whatever. That was really helpful to hear. Yeah, the, some of the most valuable feedback were from not only foundations, but individual philanthropists that we targeted as well. I think the things they said are, you know, the things we've talked about already. One is recognizing there's such a high turnover, they don't know who they're dealing with. And the other key, which was really sort of a surprise, but maybe not, is they, they just felt that while there's incredible competency and intelligence among the professionals, they were missing some of the social skills, what we might call emotional intelligence, just to be able to recognize you know, and something as simple as listening. So those are the kinds of things that we're hearing from them. And finally, uh, you know, the, they just talk about research. You know, don't don't come into a meeting unprepared. Do you think the primary market for this is people already working at fundraising or people who want to get into it? We definitely wrestled with that. Dan, I, I know you have some strong thoughts on pipelines. and Yeah, uh, obviously, we want to we're, we're, we're concerned about both. I think the certificate program is for people who have some experience already in fundraising. I think they need to sort of compare where I've been and where I'm going um, as opposed to an introduction to the field. Um, part of our discussion that came out uh, and part of the discussion that was a result of the survey showed the, what we believe is a, another great opportunity to encourage people in one profession to consider coming into the nonprofit and the fundraising field, as well as those who are program officers for nonprofits who really have not done any fundraising, but feel like they would like to have a little bit of ammunition before they, they jump in. I wanted to ask if you have also thought about um, 
how this opportunity would compare with the CFRE um, because that the CFRE certif you know the certified fundraising executive credential is an international credential. It, I mean, it requires people to test for it, but it is a credential that is internationally recognized um, and definitely would not come with this price tag. I think the, the cost of taking the test is, you know, 700 for people that are members of collaborative organizations and probably eight or 900 for those who are not. Um, and so if, if there's any thought to maybe work with them to allow people that come to who complete this certificate to test for the CFRE, which would kind of do double duty and, and really benefit the people who complete this certificate, who would also want that international credential as well. Uh, that's a great idea. I mean, maybe one of the uh, the outcomes of the of the certificate program is the opportunity to test for the CFRE. Um, uh, you know, the CFRE. I think um, you know it's valuable, but it. it the two things it lacks, I think, is sort of the personal connection and the idea of the cohort that we're learning from each other after the course is done, so to speak. And uh, and the other is just much more personal attention that will be provided by uh, an intensive um, in-class experience. The program will evolve as we um, hear from both potential uh, participants and those who've gone through the program. And Marcella, on your point, thank you for making that. And in my mind, we were uh, with this uh, program launch. Um, I always believed we would affiliate with CFRE as a as a um, one of their continuing education providers, a recognized provider, so folks could who were in the CFRE could use the certificate in fundraising as uh, you know a recognized. Uh, activity for their ongoing, but what I hadn't thought about is is planfully making the opportunity for testing connected to what the certificate offers. So thank you for raising that. Um, I think it was the Chronicle of Philanthropy that came out with a report last year that um, sexual harassment is a big problem in the field, and one of the reasons, one of the main reasons why some people leave. Um, I think that the statistic was appalling that over fifty percent of development. Uh, staff have been sexually harassed in their role. Um, is there any plan to address that, either how to prevent it or to equip professionals to deal with it when it happens? I think that would be, it's a small piece, but I think that would be a significant component if it's that common. That's something that should be addressed throughout the profession, not just the fundraisers, but obviously because the support's needed at the at the director or CEO level as well as at the board level. Uh, an organization has to be willing to walk away from a donor, and that's always a tough thing to do. In the class or the session on solicitation, we will talk about the relationship, what's appropriate, not appropriate, um, and how to deal with it. Um, there's a lot of complexity in all that, and the sexual harassment is incredibly important. But it's one that, you know, again, can't. It, it's not only good enough for the, the fundraiser. It has to be the team that's supporting that fundraiser. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Good point. Can you all talk a little bit more about the scholarship opportunities that would be available? Um, I'm just reflecting on my own experience. So it's been 15 years for me since I graduated from the Mendel Center. And, you know, over the course of 15 years, I, I've just had to learn, you know, as, as Seven was saying, I've had to just learn these skills as I've gone along, being an executive director, being in many, many meetings, now being with a larger nonprofit, I don't know that my employer at the time would have perceived my lower level status, even though I was in the fund development, on the fund development team, I don't know that they would have looked at me and felt that I was worth the investment. I felt that way about myself, but to be totally honest, being a younger woman of color, I don't know that they would have perceived it the same way. But they could be at a larger institution that may have the money to pay for this person to do it outright, but they don't see that person as someone who they are willing to invest in. So I'm just wondering, how will that work? This, this is still in process. We've had good traction with some donors who are fully in with like, I want to offer 100% scholarship to selected individuals and then trusting us to figure out how to make those available to the, to the right target uh, attendees. And then there are a number of kind of 
uh, like UBF and other funders who have said, you know, we would pay for a cohort of folks from our grantees. And whether it's 100% or 75% scholarship, I mean, I'm hearing what you're saying because if the price is zero, then we've totally eliminated the barrier. But if it's 1500 and that's still the price on the table for the attendee, that may not be possible. So we're still we're still trying to figure that out. But I want to say we've had more success in getting scholarship commitments than anything else. One more question. I know just like the BVU model is unique here in Cleveland and probably possibly most of the country. Is this unique? I mean, are there other graduate social work schools or other programs similar to this or like this throughout the country that are offering, you know, the same type of certification? We looked at Actually, we looked at all graduate degree programs that had nonprofit fundraising as a concentration or dedicated master's programs and professional development. And they're just all so very different. I mean, the only one that has any kind of recognition name wise is from IU's Lilly School. Um, and that's one we did, we looked at and we heard from folks in our interviews and uh, other things it's like, it's frustrating. Why don't we have this? Why should we have to rely on Indiana to deliver this? We're we're expert here in this community already. Why can't we build on that? Right, right. And Robin, that is that that's not coming out of a school of social work, right? Oh no. Well, it's a school of philanthropy. Yeah. Yeah. So just in terms of thinking about, you know, the perspective that we would lay on this as a school of social work, it it, it gives it a really unique footprint. But I just wanted to just underscore that, you know, at the end of the day, what we are really interested in is change uh, the composition of who's sitting around the table, right? And change the capacity of, of small organizations and their abilities to really compete for larger funds. We want to try to equal the playing field. This is really a small investment in terms of thinking about how you sort of turbocharge some of the already investments that they are making, you know, thinking about these small agencies where you just have one person in, fu in fund development and creating this cohort model where we're really able to sort of build some synergy and informational capital across groups that are very often excluded from that type of informational capital. So just really excited. Just want to just add my gratitude for all the thoughtful comments and for folks participating. I hope this program will generate creative ideas within the community on how we can um, how we can improve and how we can accelerate the success of each of the organizations.